Hello and welcome to Lost Ladies Found. My name is Graham Watts and I'm the curator of um, all the plays that you'll see on this channel. Um, and along with the plays, we, we try and do a kind of introduction to the authors so that people can use them and have some context before they watch the plays or after if, if they want to. Um, today I'm going to speak about Margaret Cavendish. And you're probably wondering why my Zoom background is this kind of, where is it? There it is. Uh, this medieval, it looks like a castle, doesn't it? Um, or the entrance to a monastery. It was an entrance to a monastery. And it was also the entrance to where Margaret Cavendish lived in Colchester. Um, during the Civil War, her house was completely razed to the ground. The family's home was completely razed to the ground. There's nothing left of it, um, apart from this uh, medieval arch. And um, why we start with that, I wonder. Um, it's because you see the entrance there, just through that there, um, about 60 feet the other side um, is another wall, a modern wall that, that's been built um, by the developers. And on that wall, I'm going to share screen something with you. Um, this is going to appear. There you go. A nice blue plaque to Margaret Cavendish. Um, and underneath it, there'll be um, a QR code um, and people can um, use their phones or devices, other devices, and find out more about Margaret Cavendish. Or they could, I'll stop screen sharing, um, they could come to this channel and I'll tell them all, all about it. Um, one of the first things that people ask me about Margaret Cavendish is, why don't we know about her? She's obviously a genius and no one knows about her. Um, a couple of reasons for that, um, and they're the age-old reasons. Um, the first being that um, she was labelled as insane. Uh, that came from Samuel Pepys, who was chasing her all over the town and she didn't want anything to do with him and he called her a mad conceited woman and that label unfortunately stuck and um, even a hundred years later Walter Scott um, put in one of his novels the mad duchess of Newcastle Margaret Cavendish that was her title um, and it's continued even Virginia Woolf in her book um, A Room of One's Own she absolutely slaughters um, Margaret Cavendish and that's quite interesting for, for the channel because um, Margaret, uh, Virginia Woolf's first cousin was Florence Henrietta Darwin. And we have one of her plays on the channel um, that you can watch for free called The New Year. It, it's a folk play. And the other thing that connects us with Virginia Woolf and that kind of attitude to Margaret Cavendish is um, what Susanna Centerleaf says. And we've got that on a channel as well. There's an introduction to one of her plays where she talks about um, how women don't support other women. Um, I'm certainly not going to talk about that, but it's there with Susanna St. Lira if you want to watch it. Um, so I suppose we should come on to Margaret Cavendish. The thing that I should mention, and I forgot to mention, is that that blue plaque will go up on the September the 22nd at 5 p.m. in Colchester. It'll be unveiled by the Lord Lieutenant. Um, now, not very far from where this gate is, in, just up the road there, is Colchester Castle. And that's got two connections uh, with Cavendish. The first one is um, her brother, again during the Civil War, was put up against the wall of Colchester Castle and shot. And there's a memorial to him. Um, it's about a half a mile walk, I guess, from uh, the home to Colchester Castle. And when Margaret was growing up, she'd have seen uh, so-called witches taken to Colchester Castle and well, burnt, murdered. Uh, it was the age of, um, you know, the witch finder general, Matthew Hopkins. Uh, he actually killed 202 years. Um, so when Margaret was, I'm just looking at my notes here, when Margaret was age 20, um, 33 women would have been taken to that castle and obviously brutally murdered. Now, you know, growing up in that kind of atmosphere, you'd think she'd keep her mouth shut, um, but she didn't. And I'm, I'm going to read a lot today from Margaret Cavendish because I'd rather have her speak than me. And here's the sort of things that she says. The truth is, Women live like bats or owls, labour like beasts and die like worms. And she carried on writing and she said, Though I cannot be Henry V or Charles II, yet I endeavour to be Margaret 
the first. And of course, some of the things that she was writing, uh, and we'll look at a few in a second, but they were really controversial. And you've got to remember, this is the time of uh, Cromwell, the interregnum, when she's writing um, in exile. And she wrote a play called The Convent of Pleasure, which in itself is a bit of a tease because it's all women um, in a convent. And um, lo and behold, there's a loving lesbian relationship um, within that play. And the stage direction is they embrace and kiss and hold each other in their arms. Now, if that's not controversial enough, this is what one of the characters says. These my embraces, though a female kind, may be as fervent as a masculine mind. I mean, what separates Margaret, though, from our other writers and why we've got that blue plaque is that she's much more than a playwright. I mean, the range of her interests is astonishing. She published a biography, an autobiography, philosophy, or orations, which she called dialectical speeches, letters, poetry, novels, short stories, children's fable, and scientific works. And she wrote 21 plays, and the famous Afro Ben, and I'm sure everybody knows, only wrote 16. Now, we've talked more about literature, but as a scientist, she was the first woman invited to attend a meeting of the Royal Society, and her books of philosophy are still studied today. Um, she was always she didn't have a formal education, but she was the first person to write a critique rather than a description of one of Shakespeare's plays. And she wrote in conjunction with a man, her husband. And we think, you know, if you can dispute it, just put it in the comments below, that she was probably the first person to write, you know, a woman to write alongside a man. Now, the other reason why you haven't heard of um, Margaret Cavendish is this nonsense about her plays were never meant to be performed. Even when we did The Unnatural Tragedy on stage, one of the reviewers said, well, this play was never meant to be performed. And you think, look, you've literally just seen it performed. <laughs> so you know it will work on the stage. Um, and they say that, you know, that they were going to be well, entitled ladies sitting around reading these plays to each other. I mean, what, well, he's got rape and incest, murder. Um, you know, educated ladies aren't going to sit around doing that, you know, the titled, titled women. Um, and it's controversial. So that's going to happen. And, not, and she lived in Derbyshire, Margaret Cavendish at the time. Um, so nobody's going to go all the way to Derbyshire just to read it with the cook filling in and coming at some of the maids playing the men. No, it's nonsense. And if you look at the second part of Love's Adventure, this is her play, uh, there's an epilogue, typical for Margaret Cavendish, she's printed at the beginning. But the epilogue says this, noble spectators. Well, obviously, they're not readers, they're spectators, they're watching the play. You have spent this day not only to see, but judge our play. She says that she is not your debtor, but you are hers until you write a better, except you clap your hands. Now, why on earth would anybody be writing that, urging people to clap their hands, um, unless it's for the, the, the stage? And then we've got scene 40 of one of her plays, A Public Wooing. Um, this is just one example. There are many, many examples of this. But there's a stage direction that says, a bed is thrust on the stage as presenting the Bible, the bride chamber. Now, why would you write the stage if there wasn't one? Um, the other thing is the punctuation. If you look at the punctuation, for example, of Frere's speech um, in The Unnatural Tragedy, when he calls up the devils to assist him in his evil deeds, the punctuation follows the style of the first folio, which is not using periods, full stops, um, but breaking, breaking the uh, text up with colons and semicolons for the actor's breath. Now, she would have known that because... Her husband, she said, um, learned to act from Ben Johnson back in the Elizabethan Jacobean period. And in fact, her husband was um, Ben Johnson's patron. My best patron next to King is what he said. And I think she's picked that up because her husband also wrote plays from him. And so she's writing for actors, not for readers. And the other thing is if she wanted to write a, a, a kind of play to be read, um, she could do, and she did. She wrote a play called The Contract, 
um, sorry, she wrote a short story called The Contract, and that short story is entirely dialogue. It reminds me very much of John Steinbeck, um, who, who wrote um, The Play Novelettes, if you've ever um, come across those. So there we go, she's written that. And then in The Blazing World, which was her novel, published in 1666, which is an unfortunate um, date. Um, but she herself appears in the novel as a character within the novel. It's a work of science fiction, one of the early works of science fiction. And one of the characters in that says, but you have made plays, replied the Empress. Yes, answered the Duchess, which is Cavendish. I intended them for plays, but the wits of these present times condemn them as incapable of being represented or acted because they were not made up according to the rules of art. I'll speak about that um, later. And then she wrote 13 introductions to her plays when they were published, uh, which couldn't stop. So, and when she had them republished, she added another two introductions. So she had a lot to say, Margaret Cavendish. But the very, 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 very last thing she says in the last introduction, the last words we hear from Margaret Cavendish herself is, I will venture, in spite of the critics, to call them plays. And this is put in italics. And if you like them so, well and good. If not, there is no harm done. And so, farewell. And that's the last um, that we, we hear from her. I mean, it's true that it's extremely unlikely for, um, to, to her plays to be produced during her lifetime. Um, A, because you know plays were banned at that particular time. Um, and B, her husband was public enemy number one because he was a royalist uh, general. And the, of course, the content, it just couldn't be placed on, on stage because it's too controversial, um, which is why Margaret wrote, I regard not so much the present, but future ages for which I intend all my books. Books was another word for uh, play at that particular time. Um, now, the other thing, I hope that argument is now gone, that these plays are there to be performed. And if you don't believe me, there's one on the channel um, which um, I directed with a group of Indian actors. Um, and you can, it's the Unnatural Tragedy. You can, you can watch it if, if you want to. It's, it, it's completely and utterly free. Um, now, at this particular time, drama followed the unities of time, the Aristotle, the Aristotle um, rules of place, time and action. In other words, everything happened in one day and so on. And she wasn't ever having any of that. She, she wrote, as for the niceties of rules, forms and terms, I renounce and profess that if I did understand and know them strictly, as I do not, I would not follow them. And if any dislike my writings for want of those rules, forms and terms, let them not read them. For I'd rather my writings should be read, unread, than read by such pedantical, scholastical persons. And she talks about how, her, how she writes her scenes. Now you'll see if you watch the, um, uh, the kind of recording of The Unnatural Tragedy that the scenes are often four lines long. When you get the script, it looks like a film script. Um, and that's her writing, that's not me editing or anything such as that. She just wrote these very short scenes. In other words, you know, she makes an impact just, just as film does today. And this is what she said, she says about the scenes. Some last longer than others some, and some are ended when others are begun. Likewise, some of my scenes have no acquaintance or relation to the rest of the scenes, although in one of the same play. And that's certainly true um, in The Unnatural Tragedy. There's, there's um, two gentlemen who just wander in and out and uh, sort of comment on things throughout. It reminds me very much of, of Gertrude Stein. And again, if you want to watch a Gertrude Stein play, um, it, there is one here on the channel. There's also an interview with um, uh, Leos Ensemble who, in, in Dallas, Texas, um, who created that. I mean, The Natural Tragedy has 48 scenes. Um, and if you look at the cast, nine of the cast are women and 70% of the dialogue is spoken by female voices. I mean, even today, that would be very rare to see a, uh, a play and nine of the cast 
are, are women. Um, yeah, now within that play, she makes a number of controversial statements. You've got to remember this is 1662, the plays were published. So it was probably around 1658, 1660, something like that, that she was, she was writing um, uh, anyway, 350 years ago. And she has the audacity to suggest that women might make more political, better political leaders than men. And within the play, one of the characters says, if we women did govern, we should govern the world better than it is, for it cannot be governed worse than it is. For the whole world is to give her by the ears, all up in wars and blood, which shows there is a general defect in the rulers and governors thereof. I mean, it's a good point, isn't it, that if you're a leader of the country and you take that country to war, you don't deserve to be that. You, you should have negotiated and sorted that out before it came to, to killing people. Um, what about this that she says about politicians, which might ring a few bells today? She says, the state councillors in this age have more formality than policy and more plausible words than rewardable deeds. It's kind of what we say about um, politicians, you know, they're, they're good at talking, um, but they never actually do anything. Your life stays exactly the same. Uh, and those words are said by um, what she calls the virgins in the unnatural tragedy. Um, that's not in a sexual sense. It's just that they're naive of the world. Reminds me very much of Mary McCarthy's novel um, in the 60s, The Group, where um, the highly educated women leave um, Vassar and, um, and then find the world isn't like Vassar. Um, so the major focus on the play, though, is sexual politics. Um, and they're all things that we can recognise today. There's an older guy who literally gaslights his wife. Um, and he's having an affair with the maid, the classic story. He's having a, an affair with one of the staff, younger woman. Um, and he, all the time he uses this emotional abuse. So we get that with it within the play, you know, criticizing her dress sense, the way she speaks. And there's a heartbreaking line um, where she says, I hardly speak a word in one day. And he's criticizing her for talking too much. Another familiar thing. Um, yeah, and she dies w within the play. I mean, you know, and after her death, of course, he, he thinks that she's a saint. And Margaret never really, you know, it's quite opaque. Did the husband and the lover kill the wife? And there's all sorts of suggestions and people overhearing things and, and you know, and so on, you know, like a kind of murder mystery. But we never know directly. But there is, the, the very last thing that he says, that that character, he talks about his wife's pure ashes. Now, cremation was extremely unusual in the UK, in the West, at this particular time. So you have to think to yourself, why did he choose to cremate the body? Mm, I'll leave you with that one. The, the thrust of the uh, play, of course, is, is this... Um, the, 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 the sister being pursued by the brother and there's some um, horrible scenes of um, of rape and incest uh, and finally finally murder and Margaret you know because we see it all the time unfortunately oh god you know why 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 is this and Margaret is saying it's about the patriarchy um, the society we live in actually encourages this and again in the very first scene Almost the very first thing that's said is one of the characters' views that importunity and opportunity wins the night, wins the chasest she. And the idea is you only need to be persistent and find the right moment, and you can have sex with any woman you like. It reminds me of the former guy in the uh, White House boasted about grabbing them by the whatever, you know. Um, and the other thing that's in there, and again, you've got to remember that she was writing at the time, although in exile, England was a theocracy, and she's writing in English, and of course the plays would have been uh, put on in English um, in London, probably. 
But one of the characters states that God doesn't exist. He turns to his sister and he says, what gods? Old men with white beards? He's kind of mocking the, the Bible at that particular time. Um, it's also extremely funny. There's a Cavendish sketch that we put on the channel uh, that you can watch. It's where she talks about um, sexism with a sexist guy about why women can't write plays. It's satire. Um, she also writes within um, The Unnatural Tragedy uh, a section about married couples farting in bed. And of course, the, uh, the virgins, of course, are, are very, very funny as well. Getting back to what she depicts within the play, and it's not pleasant, I have to say, it isn't pleasant. And some of the things, particularly the emotional abuse, when I was sitting in the audience when we played it in, on stage in, in London, you could see women, their faces drop because they recognised those situations, unfortunately. And after the play one evening, I was in the bar and um, this guy came up to me and he introduced himself. And he was the a detective inspector in the London Metropolitan Police Domestic Abuse Unit. And he said to me, and I've written it down because I'll never forget it. He said to me, because he's working with sexual violence every single day. And he said, man, she knew what she was writing about. Everything in that play is true. And that's from a contemporary police officer who works with domestic abuse. It kind of echoes what Margaret Husband William wrote, uh, because he wrote the epilogue to the unnatural tragedy. And his epilogue said, our poetess have done her part, and you, to make it sadder, know this story's true. A plaudatory you'll give, if think it fit, for one, for none, will say, this play is well writ. Yeah. Um, I'll read that again. For none but will say this play is well writ. I think I missed the but out. So basically he's saying this, the story's true. Now, we talked earlier about her um, introductions to the plays, the 15 in introductions. And the very last one ends with this. I care not where my dust or bones remain. So my works live, the labour of my brain. I covered not a stately cut, carved tomb, but that my works in fame's house may have room. Thus, I my poor cottage am content, when that I die may be my monument. So she's asking not for a nice fancy tomb, but rather that her plays would live on. Unfortunately, the complete opposite happened, and her husband built her and him a marvellous tomb in Westminster Abbey, which you can still visit, and, and he made sure that she had, she had pens in her hands so that everybody knew that she was a, a, a writer. So she got the tomb, but she didn't get the kind of recognition that she deserves in this particular case as a playwright, but in so many other fields. But hey, we got the blue plaque, so, you know, we're getting there. Hopefully people will start to follow Margaret Cavendish. Now, there's lots of plays on the channel and because it's YouTube and there's copyright issues, we can only put plays on there that, um, that are out of copyright. If you contact me, I'm more than happy to supply you with scripts or whatever it is that, that you need or answer any questions or talk about um, any of the authors that we have on our channel. There are a couple of plays that I did on stage. One was on Zoom, actually, um, which was Gary by Sophie Treadwell, which is a four-hander. Um, that, unfortunately, is, is um, still in copyright, but I do have a copy of that. It's extremely rare. I'm happy to share with it. And also Direct Action, which hopefully Frenchies are going to be publishing soon. It's by Gita Salvi. It's the, it was literally found in a hat box. Uh, about 20 years ago. So we did that um, via, via Zoom in conjunction with, um, with Frenchies because of the um, pandemic. So yeah, I'm very, very happy to share. Um, I hope you like 
the, the kind of work that we're doing and, and, and what we're trying to achieve. Um, and if you can subscribe and spread the word and do all those things, it, it, it helps the it helps the channel. So um, thank you very much, and to the next time when we talk about yet another lost lady. Thank you. Bye bye.